The U.S. government recently used an unrelated national defense law to cancel visa access for certain kinds of dual citizens from coming to the United States. The visa in question is what's called an E-2 visa. It's a sort of residence permit to spend time in the United States if you have a business that you own there. And yet it's different from the way that you might think about moving to the United States like a green card. It brings more tax friendliness, it's more lightweight, it doesn't lead to U.S. citizenship, but for many people that doesn't matter. And so now the option to use that E-2 visa is being taken away for certain kinds of dual citizens. I'm going to explain why. Let me set the stage here. So if you own a business in the United States, or if you're willing to buy a business in the United States for an undescribed amount of money, but we generally understand it starts at $150,000, $200,000, $250,000 of at-risk capital that you put into a business that's relatively easy to understand. So marketing agency, not so good. Plumbing company, better, okay? No exact terms, but that's what immigration lawyers that we've worked with will generally tell you. And for certain nationals, they might want more at-risk capital. It's all taken on a case-by-case -case basis. But basically, you buy a business, you get to go to the United States. And you can live there if you'd like for as long as your E-2 visa is valid. Every time it comes up for renewal, you have to go in and say, hey, I'm creating jobs, I'm paying taxes, I'm creating something for the country. But what's different about E-2 versus, let's say, an EB-5 or some other way to get a green card is that a green card holder is essentially in the same tax category as a U.S. citizen. They are a U.S. person by default, which means they're liable for all uh, the U.S. tax requirements, which means if you've got businesses overseas, uh, if you've got uh, foreign bank accounts, foreign companies, that all goes into the U.S. tax pot. And so you know how the, the same U.S. tax compliance that many U.S. citizens are facing when they move overseas. So if you just want to buy a Subway franchise or a series of Subway franchises in the U.S. and come from time to time to manage those, you probably don't want all your businesses in your home country to be dragged into the U.S. tax net just so that you have the privilege of managing um, you know, that franchise. And so the E-2 allows you to, uh, if you spend uh, a limited amount of time in the U.S. every year, stay out of that tax net. And so for people who just want to manage their business part-time, they need just to come and go, it's a way to do that. And it's you know, theoretically easier and, and more understandable than having a tourist visa. And obviously, many countries, their passports don't have tourist visas. Now, here's the rub, and here's why this affects dual citizens in some cases, is that uh, getting an E-2 visa is limited to certain treaty countries. Not everyone's eligible. And so there's a reason, for example, that Indians will come and take advantage of this, but the Chinese don't, because the Chinese can't. The market for Indians buying businesses in the U.S., is stronger because of the E-2. Chinese are often pitched the EB-5 visa, put your money into a regional center and, and get a green card. Now, again, certain people say, I like to live in the United States. I want to commit to living there the majority, if not all the time. I want to become a U.S. citizen, get a U.S. passport. That's where I want to live. Now, if that's the case, then an E-2 visa is probably not for you because you do have to continually renew it. We had one gentleman we worked with who uh, had an E-2 visa for something like 30 years and finally gave it up. He lived there full time, and so he paid U.S. taxes on all his foreign corporations and all the different activity he had, again, as if he was a U.S. citizen. But once he decided to scale back his time and live a lot of his time in Asia, he was able to only pay him the small part, small part of the business that was actually run from the United States. In his case, he gave up the E-2. He didn't need it anymore. He could visit as a tourist. But the E-2 gives you a certain flexibility if your country's on the list. One country that was on the list and that marketed that to second citizenship seekers was Grenada, which is one of the five uh, Caribbean citizenship by investment programs. Grenada, perhaps due to the U.S. military involvement there you know, previously, uh, was on the E-2 list. St. Lucia, St. Kitts, Antigua, uh, Dominica, they're not on the list, right? And so if you become a citizen of St. Lucia or Dominica, what have you, and you're not a U.S. citizen and you don't have the ability to simply, you know, get, a, get an ESTA preclearance if you're British or Australian or what have you, you would need to either get an EB-5 or you would need to get an O-1 if you're an exceptional talent or you need to get some other kind of work permit or you can't get an E-2, right? And so you'd have to go through one of the other visa regimes. There are other non-immigrant visa regimes or you'd have to go through the green card program, which again, perhaps... You know, especially if you're an American getting a second citizenship with the idea that maybe one day you won't be an American, the idea of you know, getting a green card kind of defeats the purpose. And so Grenada was marketed as, oh, I can get this E-2 uh, permission 
that certain other countries have, but not all of them, and that's an advantage to pay more for, for that. Now, I long thought that if I went to a U.S. embassy and said, hey, I used to be your citizen, and now I want an E-2 visa, you know, the, the response may not always be the most friendly. Certainly, perhaps, you know, if you started a business, if you started a big, business, big enough business, hey, they'd like to have your business. But listen, you know, the United States does not need somebody with a 200000 or even a you know, $20 million business. I mean, their, their issue is, should we give this person a visa? And so I was never convinced that for some people it made a big difference. I mean, the embassies have discretion to say, we don't want this person E2 treaty or not. But here's what's changed. In a recent defense bill in the U.S., they said if you obtained your citizenship by a financial investment, that you need to have domicile in that country of citizenship for three years before you're entitled to apply for an E-2 visa. And so what that means is if you obtain citizenship in Grenada uh, by a financial investment, which I'll come back to in a minute, you have to basically live there for three years. Now, what does live there mean? How long do you need to live there? It's not entirely clear. We'll see that spelled out either in actual cases or perhaps the more clarification and regulations later. But if you're not going to commit to spending time and living in Grenada, which, by the way, is not like St. Kitts or Nevis, is not like Antigua, they do have favorable taxes, but taxes nonetheless in Grenada. You're not going to you know, give up your U.S. citizenship, move to Grenada for three years, and then be able to get back in on an E-2. But all that aside, you'd have to actually live in Grenada for three years. Now, what is a financial investment? You can say, well, I donated money to Grenada to be a citizen. That's not an investment. I argue that that's probably not going to cut any ice with them. Uh, there are you know, other countries where it'll be interesting to see how it is uh, interpreted. Theoretically, a citizenship by descent country, let's say you had ancestors from Italy or something like that, you know, that's not going to be impacted. Not every European country uh, is on the E2 list that I know. And so what the U.S. is doing is they're saying, we don't want people who simply made a donation to a country to be able to come in on an E-2. And you can say, okay, well, you know, that's somewhat fair. Why allow certain people just to cut the line because they spent $150,000 on Grenadian citizenship? And they're not saying you can never do it. They're just saying you have to have some kind of ties in that country and prove that to us over three years. Again, those rules are, are as of yet entirely unclear. And so my suggestion is, you know, if you are a U.S. citizen and you're wondering, do I always want to be a U.S. citizen? And you're saying, well, maybe I can do this E-2 thing. Nomad Capitalist works with immigration lawyers all over, the, all over the world, including some in the United States. I'm not an immigration lawyer, so don't take this as legal advice. But, you know, my thought is, you know, if, if you were to obtain citizenship in aforementioned Italy, for example, you may have an easier time than if you went and, you know, lived in Grenada for three years, should you be a former uh, American. That's all, you know, pure, pure conjecture. This does for me, though, if you're obtaining second citizenship, either because you come from an emerging country like China, where your options for getting into the U.S. are more limited, whether you're someone who doesn't want to be an American, this is making the idea of running a business as a way to get a you know, visa, to get access to the U.S., uh, less appealing. Now, again, there are other ways to, to get in. The O-1, we've had some clients who did have an O-1 visa, an exceptional talent. You know, I think one person was you know, the foremost expert on a certain kind of architecture. Uh, and that worked. But again, I think in part worked because they had a very high quality passport. They were not coming from Tajikistan. They were coming from Western Europe. It's like, ah, okay, fine, here's your 01, you know, go away. You know, the United States wants you to pay them taxes. They want you to be someone that fits a certain profile. And I think that there comes a time when we all have to decide, you know, where do I want to be? Uh, if I want to live in the United States and I am a U.S. citizen, you know, maybe being a U.S. citizen is the best way to secure that access. If I happen to be also a British citizen, then I'm probably always going to be allowed to come and visit. And maybe I can get an O-1 or an E-2 or whatever else. Uh, but there are no guarantees. Now, most countries work differently. Uh, when you travel around the world, most countries don't care what your passport is. But there are a few countries that really, they want you to have the right profile. They don't like it when people you know, go and get a passport by investment. When you travel to Dubai, when you travel to Singapore, when you travel to a lot of other places in the world, they don't care what your passport is. They don't care if it's the country where you're born. As long as it's a legitimate passport and, and you didn't steal it or it's not fake, they're like, okay, you're a citizen of this country. Congratulations. Are you on the list of visa-free? And I've gone to places where maybe a passport I have is new on the visa-free list and they have to go through like, uh -huh, uh -huh, J, uh -huh, J, J, K, uh -huh. all right, okay, great, stamp, in you go. There's no judgment. 
If you want access to the US, Australia, Canada is probably on the list. I think you have to make some decisions. You know, here at Nomad Capitalist, we help people legally reduce their taxes. You can move to Dubai. Um, you know, if you're an American, you don't have to stay an American. If you're anyone else, you can just move to Dubai. And you can reduce your taxes to as little as zero. You can move your banking. You can move your business offshore. You can do a lot of things. You know, there may come a time when a small number of these Western countries are like, ah, we don't really like that you were in Dubai. Ah, oh, we don't really like that you got this passport. And I'm not saying that you need to change anything. I'm not saying that if you're an American, this should change which passports you get. But I'm saying in a long-term perspective, you should think, how important is the United States to me? How important is you know, Australia to me? For me, I don't need to go to Australia. I'm not really too worried about going to Australia. I'm not too worried about going to the United States, generally speaking. But if you are, then it's worth you know, working with, with somebody like Nomad Capitalist who takes those concerns into account and makes sure you get a passport that has the right perspective, that preserves your rights and your ability to travel, and that you don't spend more than you have to, but you spend what you need to to get what you want. And I think there's far too much salesmanship in this business of, hey, here's the five passports we sell. Which one do you want? Do you like one of these beaches? That people kind of lose sight of, how do we read the tea leaves? How do we combine opinions from all the different experts? Maybe there's seven, eight, nine different experts in your case that all need to weigh in and say, okay, here's the goals. How do we make sure we get the best chance of accomplishing those, not just today, but five, 10, 20 years ago? And so if you're looking for a second passport and you want to take a holistic perspective, not only to have far more than five different passport options, but to have, you know, how do I connect that with my taxes and my lifestyle goals and everything else? then that's exactly what Nomad Capitalist does and would be happy to serve you. But for now, this, call it a loophole, to allow people to start businesses and get access to live in the U.S. without the tax status uh, has been hampered for folks who obtain citizenship by investment.